My friend Tim Crosby was a marvelous keyboard artist. Whenever he was asked to perform if the piano was an upright, well, he would agree only reluctantly because for him, there's little joy or satisfaction in plodding along on an upright, but on a well-tuned, fine quality grand piano. Oh, Tim can soar for hours without even tiring. Not only is the sound quality richer, but the performance itself is superior because of the inspiring feedback. You know, God is like that too. He is the master of music. We are his instruments. We must allow him to keep us in tune if we want to feel his fingers rippling over the keys of our lives in ways that feed others spiritually. God derives little joy from playing someone who, like sounding brass and tinkling cymbals, is out of tune. God can make music if you plead with him on an old beat-up spinet. But oh, the surging power, the symphony of praise, when God finds a Steinway. Evan J. Roberts was a Steinway. Now, how does one get to be a Steinway for God? Simply by wanting it badly enough to pay the price in prayer. Now, all of his life, Roberts had hungered to do more for Jesus. As a child, he loved to pray and read his Bible. He went to church five nights a week from the age of 13 as he worked in the coal mines. Roberts prayed that God would bring revival to Wales. Sometimes he skipped meals to pray, and he frequently rose in the middle of the night to plead for revival. Now, please keep in mind that there can be no question of earning God's favor. Mm -mm. The initiative lies not with human beings, but with God. God chooses an instrument and places within his or her heart a yearning for the salvation of others. But we can ask to be chosen. Well, at age 26, Roberts quit his job as a minor and became a student at Newcastle Amillennial College in training for the ministry. When Presbyterian evangelist Seth Joshua began revival meetings nearby in September 1904, he took Roberts and 20 other young people along with him. One day, Joshua prayed, O oh Lord, bend us. And the Holy Spirit said to Roberts, that is what you need. Hmm. Roberts prayed, Lord, bend me. That day, after 13 years of prayer, Roberts received a powerful baptism of the Holy Spirit. From that moment on, he was ablaze for God. Earlier in this series, we learned that we should not hesitate to ask a great king for great gifts. Roberts didn't. He pleaded with God for 100,000 souls. And God gave him the assurance that his prayers would be answered. But how was God going to convert a hundred thousand souls? Many of them rough, tough Welsh miners. Well, God evidently decided to bring heaven down to Wales. God used another anointed servant, others besides Evan Roberts, with unusual power during 1904. Throughout the country, the citizens had an overwhelming sense of the tangible presence of God. It was everywhere, not just in churches, but out in the streets, and God was in the homes, and in the trains, and in the mines, down underground. Even in taverns, people came under conviction, leaving their drinks untouched on the counter. Roberts felt impressed to get permission to leave his classes and return to his family to begin a series of meetings in his hometown of Lufferon. 
He asked the pastor if he could speak to those present at a prayer meeting. Well, somewhat reluctantly, the pastor allowed him to speak to those who cared to wait to hear him after the meeting. Seventeen people stayed to hear him. I have a message for you from God, Robert said. You must confess any known sin to God and put right any wrong done to someone else. Second, you must put any doubtful habit out of your life. Third, you must obey the Spirit promptly. And finally, you must confess your faith in Christ publicly. The meeting was a difficult one, but by 10 o'clock p.m., all 17 had responded. While well, the pastor, impressed, invited him back to preach on the following night and then for the entire week following. Well, during his meetings, Roberts did a little preaching. He would recite God's promises about the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit led him to ask his congregation to simply pray out loud one after another. Send the Holy Spirit now for Jesus' sake. Each night, more individuals surrendered to the power of God. The meetings rapidly drew larger and larger and larger crowds. Soon newspaper headlines read, great crowds of people drawn to Lufferan. One article said that a man, well, it was a young man by the name of Evan Roberts was causing great surprise. The main road on which the church stood was packed with people trying to get in. Many closed their shops early to find a seat. One reporter wrote that the meeting he attended closed at 4.25 in the morning. And then the people didn't seem to want to go home. They were still standing outside the church talking about what had happened. In a very British summary, he wrote, I felt this was no ordinary gathering. Once the news media spotlighted the movement, well, it just spread like wildfire across Wales. See, God kept his promise. 100,000 people were converted in the five months of that revival. Roberts was once asked his secret. I have no secret, he said. Ask, and ye shall receive. Five years later, J.V. Morgan wrote a book to debunk the revival. His main criticism was that the, of the 100,000 who had joined the churches during the revival, well, only 80,000 still stood firm. Only 80,000. But the cultural values of Wales changed overnight. Bookshops sold out of Bibles. The crime rate plummeted. Taverns went bankrupt. The illegitimate birth rate dropped 44% within a year. Drunkards and gamblers and broken families were healed. The district councils held emergency meetings to discuss what to do with the police, who now had nothing to do. In fact, one police sergeant was asked uh, what do you do with your time? Well, before the revival, we had two main jobs. One was to prevent crime, and the other was to control crowds, as at football games. But since the revival started, we have practically no crime. So now we just go with the crowds. What does that mean? The official asked. Well, he said, you know, where the crowds are, they're packing the churches. Well, how does that affect the police? Well, among the 17 police in our station, we have three gospel quartets now. And if any church wants a quartet, we simply call the police station. <laughs> now, you might not believe this next part of the story. A slowdown occurred down underground in the mines. So many Welch coal miners were converted and stopped using bad language 
that the horses that pulled the carts in the mines couldn't understand what was being said to them. It took a while before the horses grew accustomed to the new language, such mild language without all the swear words. People spent their free time in revival meetings up to four a day at 7.30 a.m. and 10 o'clock a.m., 2 o'clock p.m. and 7 o'clock p.m. The latter meetings often lasted until early morning hours. There was much spontaneous singing. When one church was full, the meetings would overflow to another church down the street. People would walk up and down the streets singing hymns, sometimes all night. So great was the impact of that movement that revival swept Great Britain and broke out into Norway. It so moved Norway that the Norwegian parliament actually passed special legislation to permit laypersons to conduct Holy Communion because the clergy couldn't keep up with the number of converts who wanted to participate. The movement swept Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, and of course the United States. Revival fire leaped over the Atlantic and broke out in America in 1905. According to Kenneth Scott Lotterette, one of the leaders of the 1905 revival, fully 25% of the student body at Yale University, enrolled in prayer meetings and Bible studies that year. J. Edwin Orr mentions three cities as examples in the USA. The ministers of Atlantic City reported that out of a population of 50,000, only 50 adults were left unconverted. The pastor of the First Baptist Church in Paducah, Kentucky, was an old man by the name of J.J. Cheek. He took, he took in 1,000 new members in two months, and he finally died of overwork. Over there in Portland, Oregon, 200 department stores closed from 11 o'clock a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. for prayer. They signed agreement among themselves that they would not cheat and stay open. Listen, such a little spark can kindle such a great fire. Evan Roberts asked God for 100,000 souls. And after 13 years of prayer, he got them and more. So I guess the question is this, what have you been asking God for lately? What have I been asking for? We need a revival in our churches in the worst sort of way, but it has a price. The price of revival is prayer. It takes persistent, united prayer to bring a revival. God has promised in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. How would you like God to begin a revival in your church? Could God do for us what he did for Wales back there in 1904? Better yet, could he do for us what he did for the Christians in the Roman Empire back in the days of Acts? Well, he could if we prayed prayers like they did. You know, the book of Acts has more references to prayer than any other book in all of the Bible. And the very first one is very succinct. Acts 1 verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Listen. That's the condition. That's the price of revival. In John 20, 
verse 21, we find Jesus bestowing his Holy Spirit upon his disciples. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This was a down payment on the fullness of the Spirit that would be poured out on the church at Pentecost. Now, in the Old Testament, only prophets, priests, kings received the Holy Spirit. But in the Gospel dispensation, the Holy Spirit is poured out on sons and daughters, maids and milkmen, butchers, bakers and candlestick makers, common people like you and me. God says to each of us today, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And he is waiting just now to waft his gentle breath into your soul as a down payment of the mighty tempest of power that is to come. Are you ready to receive it? In Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Call on me. I'm waiting. Turn off the television and dust off the family altar. Pray together with one purpose and one accord, and watch me do things beyond imagining. Watch me tap into my hidden treasure and unleash rivers of resources you never knew existed. Watch me unbolt locked doors and tear down strongholds and batter down the gates of hell. Watch me set the church on fire to burn vast swaths of enemy territory. Watch me create a new future for your life and your congregation. Just call on me. Seek my face. Here I am, waiting. Why not let your church be the beginning of God's next great revival? If you'd like to see what happens, then just pray, one by one, two by two, in small groups, this week, next week, and next year. Pray like you've never prayed before. Call a moratorium on theological nitpicking and pray without ceasing. Pray in season and out of season. Pray as if your life depended on it. Pray as if there were no tomorrow. Fast and pray until you hear the sound of abundant rain. Pray until God sends the mighty rushing wind. Pray until the fire falls. Just pray and claim God's amazing promise in Matthew 22, verse 21. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Thank <laughs> you.